Welcome back, everyone, as we conclude. I'm a little sad about it. Honestly, I've been really enjoying this series. And uh, while part of me is anxious to move on to something new and uh, cover some new topics, uh, it's been quite a journey, and I've learned a ton. I hope you have as well. hope you've enjoyed the journey. Uh, if you have suggestions for other things you'd like me to do reactions to, great opportunity to do that is in the comment section of this video as I think about what's next. I'm going to throw up a vote uh, over on Patreon uh, for those who might want to have a say in some things coming down the road. Um, but always, as always, please leave your comments. I do listen to those things. A lot of videos I've done reactions to have been directly as a result of a recommendation from someone. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and dive into this. As always, there's a link in the description that will take you all the way back to episode one if you have not seen my reaction to the series to this point. There's a link to the original content. And as with, I think, most, if not all, series that Extra History does, uh, there is a lies episode where they cover some of the stuff that they get wrong. And here's what happens. I know exactly how this goes down, okay? So you can do all the research. You can kind of inform yourself as best you can when putting together a video series like this. But inevitably, there's somebody out there who knows way more about this than you ever, ever will, even if you do a bunch of research. And they will inevitably point those things out to you. Uh, and uh, so there's always a, a lies episode they do at the end where they cover some of the stuff maybe they got wrong. So I don't react to the lies videos, but I encourage you to check those out. Uh, so uh, you can do that just by going to their channel. Let's go ahead and dive into part six. Well into his middle age and with a mighty empire under his control, Genghis Khan's thoughts linger on what will happen to that empire after he dies. What will become of his family? What will become of the world he has worked so hard to shape? Now, one thing I will say that I would have done in this situation is I probably would have shown a picture of the globe on the other side. You know, the part where Genghis Khan is. He doesn't even know any of this exists. So anyway, just a minor quibble. Hard to shape. The 13th century. The Muslim lands of the Khwarezm Empire were the richest and most sophisticated in the world. Its citizens soared above their contemporaries in Europe, India, and China in astronomy, mathematics, agronomy, and many other fields. But because they stood higher, they had the furthest to fall. A hundred thousand Mongol horsemen stormed the Khwarezm cities. The Sultan of Khwarezm had four times as many soldiers, but the Mongol forces were terrifying. And they honored their promise of clemency to all who surrendered as strictly as they honored their promise of destruction to all who resisted. Cities fell one after another. Many surrendered without a fight. Others held out for a few days or weeks before falling. After defeating each city, Genghis Khan sent clerks to divide the civilian population by profession, including doctors, astronomers, judges, engineers, teachers, artisans, and religious leaders. They especially sought out people who spoke multiple languages. Despite all of their growth, wealth, and power, the Mongols still practiced no crafts themselves other than war, herding, and hunting. So this is pretty fascinating. Uh, you know, immediately every time you take a city, looking for the smartest, the brightest, the most skilled, uh, and putting them to use in making your empire stronger. It's pretty wise, but also can be potentially dangerous uh, as you put people in key positions of influence that might resent you for what you've done. Um, but I would imagine he has the structure in place to prevent that from happening. All of the skilled work done in their growing empire was done by the people they conquered. They needed teachers as much as they needed riches. But one group in particular could expect no mercy from the Mongol forces. That group being the wealthy and the powerful. Under the chivalrous rules of warfare as practiced in Europe and the Middle East during the Crusades, aristocrats were protected and kept as hostages to be ransomed. The Mongols had no use for such pleasantries. So this is really fascinating because this is taking the way he's kind of turned things around and made it about meritocracy. In other words, about your abilities rather than what family you were born into or what title you have or how much money you have. Uh, you know, which is something that isn't practiced in a lot of places in the world at this time. This is really turning it on its head because this is absolutely true. Uh, you know, if you were fighting in a foreign war, there were certain 
protections, certain um, expectations that you might have as a nobleman that others could not expect on the battlefield. To prevent future wars, they sought out and eliminated any enemy aristocrats they could find. Makes sense. Aristocrats offered nothing of value to the Mongols, and were the most likely to resist them successfully in the future. By eliminating the aristocracy, they decapitated the social system of their enemies. And you know what else this does too, is these are the people who are funding and leading the enemy armies. And so if you are one of these aristocrats who is funding or leading an army that's in his path, you're going to think twice about whether or not you're going to resist. You might even just flee because you don't want to end up like these other guys do. As the 1220s rolled in, Genghis Khan was in his 60s, at the height of his power, with nothing and no one standing in his way. But despite his overwhelming success as a conqueror, he was really struggling as a father. Custom held that each son in a herding family inherited some of their family's herd. Genghis Khan intended to instead offer each son a piece of his empire. However, he also needed to choose one son to be the next great Khan after he died. All right, so let's pause right there because we all know how this is going to go down because it goes down all over the place. When Alexander the Great died, his empire gets divided among multiple people. You know, this happens when Charlemagne dies and his empire gets divided. Uh, anytime this happens, even if you name one to be the one in your place, you know the brothers are going to turn on each other. It's just what happens. I mean, even with uh, like Richard the Lionheart, him and his siblings fought. While their dad was still alive, they were fighting over his kingdom. He summoned a family coral tie to discuss the matter. His two eldest sons, Jochi and Chagatai, were tense and terse with one another. Ogade, his third son, arrived to the meeting slightly late and also slightly inebriated. Genghis Khan asked his eldest son, Jochi, to speak first on the matter of succession. In doing so, he emphasized Jochi's rank as his eldest son, implying he was the likely successor. Chagatai did not agree, and interrupted before Jochi could answer. Jochi lunged at his brother, and the two men started to fist fight. Genghis Khan broke up the fight and tearfully pleaded with his sons, begging them to understand how different things were before they were born. When Total preview of what is going to happen. I mean, the man didn't even get to start speaking before they come to blows. Not going to work. Nobody was safe. He ordered them to respect each other, but he knew that he could not impose a choice on them that would last after his death. They would have to find a compromise. After much discussion, the family decided that neither Chagatai nor Jochi should become their father's heir, but instead agreed that the role of successor should go to their mellow, good-natured, and hard-drinking brother, Ogade. Genghis Khan then allotted his personal lands and herds to each son and separated Jochi and Chagatai, giving them kingdoms at far opposite ends of his territory. This ordeal cast a pall over the remainder of the campaign. Genghis Khan was now keenly aware of how much work he needed to do to preserve the empire after his death. He had been so dogged in his pursuit of empire and unification that he'd neglected his family. He put much effort into trying to mend the relationship between his eldest sons. Man, isn't this something that is so true in life, right? The people often who put in the most time and effort to become successful inevitably neglect something else. Um, this is just me personally, uh, and I'm not trying to pass judgment on anybody for how they choose to do things. But for me, success is my family growing up to be healthy, well-rounded well citizens who contribute to the world, who are good people, uh, who treat others with respect and honor. Um, to me, that's my most important role is my role as a husband and a father if i get that stuff wrong it doesn't much matter how good i was at anything else um obviously it's a different time a different culture but that's just how i see the world he assigned them jointly to a campaign but neither brother could agree on what tactics to use and because of their bickering the campaign stretched on for six months an unprecedented amount of time for a mongol siege Eventually, they had no choice but to burn the city to the ground and flood it, destroying it utterly and leaving nothing to loot. 
In 1222, the Mongol conquest reached the city of Multan in modern-day Pakistan. Genghis Khan had set his sights on northern India, the seat of silk production. Here, however, he faced a new enemy that stopped him in his tracks. As soon as the Mongols left the dry and cold mountainous regions, both warriors and horses grew sick and weak. The Mongol bows, which were so well adapted to the extreme cold and heat of the steppe, weakened in the damp air and lost their accuracy. Mm. The Mongols were forced to fall back and sustained massive casualties as they withdrew to the more familiar climate of Afghanistan. A bridge too far is what we would call this today. Just going a little bit beyond where you should have, but you never know what that is until you actually do it. Despite this setback, they had succeeded in their goal of conquering the Khwarezm Empire, bringing Central Asia and much of the Middle East under Mongol control. To celebrate, Genghis Khan called for a fate that ended up being the largest hunt in history. His men cordoned off a massive area of territory, and tens of thousands of soldiers from different armies converged on the field from different directions. The hunt lasted for months, and was intended as more than a celebration. Genghis Khan also wanted to use it to mellow relations between his sons, Good luck. and to end the campaign on a cooperative note. Upon returning home, the victorious Mongol army saw the fruits of their conquest. The nation had been utterly transformed. Girls who had spent their days milking goats and yaks were now wearing silk while their new servants performed menial labor for them. Elders who had never seen metal in their lives now cut meat with Damascus steel girded with ivory hilts. They served yaks milk from silver bowls while their musicians sang to them. But Genghis Khan was not built for this life. And so again, we've talked about this already. This is so different from the picture that I think a lot of people have in their minds of the Mongol Empire. They, they picture this as this kind of roving horde of horsemen who just conquer everything in their wake, not as a cultured, civilized society with craftsmen and with uh, domestication, uh, all these sorts of things. It's a, it's a quite a f forward-thinking, uh, established uh, empire on Genghis Khan's part. He didn't want to stop conquering, or maybe he couldn't stop conquering. Couldn't. He set out once again to campaign against the Tangut, the very first foreign nation he had conquered after his election as Great Khan. The Tangut had refused to offer troops for the Khwarezm invasion, a slight that could not stand, and establishing a base in the Tangut kingdom would offer a second chance at the Sung dynasty, a target he still coveted. And that is where Genghis Khan's story very suddenly and very mysteriously ends. What happened next remains something of a mystery. Some say that while traversing the Gobi to fight the Tangut, Genghis Khan stopped to catch some wild horses and was thrown from his mount, sustaining internal injuries. Some legends say that he was assassinated by a sex worker, struck by lightning, poisoned, or killed by a magic spell cast... And this is an important note to make about the whole story that we've heard over these last six episodes. The fact that there are so many stories about how he died should give us pause in accepting a lot of things in his story as being absolutely true. Um, like we mentioned a few episodes back, a lot of this stuff is written uh, by people who have an agenda uh, as is the case with most history. We've talked many times about the example of Julius Caesar, who's obviously writing his own story with a particular agenda in mind. Uh, and so we have to consider that when we read the histories. When we don't have multiple histories from multiple sources that have competing agendas and viewpoints, it's very difficult to get a good picture of things. Uh, and so, as is the case with all of Genghis Khan's story, we have to take everything with a little bit uh, of trepidation. Like, eh, maybe this is what happened, but we can't know 100% for sure. Asked by the Tangut King. Heck, Marco Polo even reports in his book, chronicling his time in the court of Kublai Khan, uh, Genghis Khan's grandson, that the great Khan was killed after taking an arrow to the knee. All that we know for sure... There's some kind of a... Uh, reference to be made here to a video game, but I'm not going to make it <laughs> until I took an arrow to the knee. Anyway. 
sure is Skyrim. that just before the Mongol victory over the Tangut, Genghis Khan died quietly. A procession would have set out towards Mongolia with Genghis Khan's body on a simple cart. His horsehair spirit banner would have led the way, and behind the procession would have followed his horse with a loose bridle and an empty saddle. He was buried anonymously in the soil of his homeland, without a monument to mark his grave. Genghis Khan transformed Mo So I want to pause for a second there and talk a little bit about Genghis Khan's grave, because this is something that I've studied about in the past, and my understanding is that they're still looking for it. Like, there's a lot of expeditions that have happened trying to locate Genghis Khan's grave. Um, I think some sources say that wherever he's buried, a lot of the other Khans are buried too, and so if you can find him, you can find a lot of them. Um, I, I've read stories about how uh, all of the people who were involved in his burial were executed, and then the people that executed them uh, themselves took their own lives uh, or were executed by other people, all with the idea that you're not going to leave anybody alive who knows where his grave is. Uh, and this is something that has happened in other cultures. We heard stories about similar things happening in Hawaii when my wife and I were there 20 years ago on our honeymoon. Um, so, yeah, it, it's really, I mean, when you think about the vastness of that land, uh, and they have a fairly decent idea of the general region where he's probably buried, um, but it's it, it literally is a needle in a stack of needles that you're trying to find when you look for him. Mongol warfare from a messy tribal raiding system into an intercontinental affair fought on multiple fronts across thousands of miles. His battlefield techniques made the heavily armored knights of medieval Europe obsolete, replacing them with disciplined cavalry moving in organized units. He the, the problem, of course, with his units is they, they had to be highly trained. And most of these guys that are fighting this way, they've grown up with this. It's not like you can just transform your army into horse archers overnight. Um, so did it make those kinds of armies obsolete? Perhaps. But were, was it ever going to take hold in the rest of the world? Because typically when you talk about something being obsolete, immediately everybody's going to adopt that because what you did before is obsolete. So I, I probably wouldn't use the word obsolete. I would say it's very specialized and it's very difficult for other types of warfare to deal with. But it really didn't make the other stuff obsolete because the other stuff continued. Uh, plus, we're right on the, the verge of when guns are going to start being a big thing, um, you know, which gunpowder starts, I think, in China and makes its way west from there. He made brilliant use of speed and surprise on the battlefield, and perfected siege warfare to such a degree that he ended the era of walled cities. He taught his people to fight not only across incredible distances, but to sustain their campaigns over years, decades, and eventually over three generations of constant fighting. His last ruling descendant remained in power in Uzbekistan until he was deposed by the rising tide of the Soviet Revolution in 1920. That's crazy. Is that true? Was that a lit, legit, like, inheriting descendant of his? We've got to look this up. So I don't want to get into this too much, but uh, your Y chromosome DNA is inherited from passed down from father to son. Um, and so, uh, like, my, my father's 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 father in theory, should have the same Y chromosome DNA that I do, as should any other direct male line descendants of his. Uh, and there are certain haplogroups um, that are proposed as candidates, but they, they estimate that there are 16 million people uh, in the world today that um, have Genghis Khan's Y chromosome. So that's pretty uh, remarkable, first of all. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there about Genghis Khan's descent, and I guess it's pretty well documented. Uh, in, including uh, folks like Su Suleiman uh, the Magnificent, um, the Ottoman d dynasty claimed descent from Genghis Khan through his uh, son Joki, uh, Joshi, um, who I think was the one that there was some question about whether he really was Genghis Khan's son. Um, so um, all of that is uh, just really fascinating. We're not going to get into all the details of it, like I said, but uh, cool stuff. Genghis Khan was also brutal. His goals were achieved through the deaths of millions. Yes. The Mongols made no technological breakthroughs, founded no new religions, wrote no great books or dramas, and offered the world no new crafts or methods of agriculture. 
they simply conquered and assimilated. And so I guess what they're trying to say is that while the Mongol uh, Empire was powerful and was the largest like contiguous land empire the world has ever seen, um, and, and while it you know, did while Genghis Khan accomplished all those things, nothing that was put in place had a lasting like history changing forever type impact like a lot of other empires might have and their tactics left parts of the world depopulated to this day but the mongols absolutely did change the world and that was what young temujin had desperately wanted from the very moment he first learned how harsh violent and unforgiving life could be he eradicated torture, kidnapping, and raiding from his world, but at the cost of countless lives and entire cultures. Is peace bought with blood and maintained with force truly peace? It may be impossible to say whether Genghis Khan left the world better than he found it, but it was still undeniably Different. changed. Yeah. All right, that was good stuff. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I have. Uh, let me know your thoughts. Let me know your recommendations for other things you'd like to see me do a reaction to. Uh, I am off next week to the Antietam Battlefield with my friend JD from the History Underground. Uh, so I'm going to be bringing you some original content from there. I'm also working on editing some more videos uh, from my most recent trips to Europe. So be watching for those as well. Uh, and if you are really interested in the original content in particular... Uh, and you want to be able to access that easier without it being mixed in with all of the reaction videos, there's a link in the description to my channel VTH Originals, which is a depository for all of my original content. I'm still uploading stuff that's already on this channel, uh, but it's just an, an easier way to find all the original content without uh, having to dig through all of the stuff that's on here as well. So you can check that out. You can also check out my VTH Extra, my gaming channel. All of the links are in the description. Thanks for watching.